Welcome to Happy Hour! Hello, everyone. Welcome to all of our returning audience members, and welcome to anybody who's new to Solestina's Happy Hours. I'm Kevin Kumar. I'm the co-director of Solestina, and this is our 74th Happy Hour. Um, it's kind of staggering to think <laughs> that we've done. This is going to be our 74th event, and, um, and that's it. I'll turn it over to Maya. <laughs> Hello, everyone. I'm Maya Jasper White, uh, Kevin's co-director. I am so, so happy to introduce you to the author of, ooh, can you even see it? Yes, kind of, with the virtual background. This book and all the books that are behind me in my virtual background, um, Ted is someone you can easily, easily Google and read upon. So um, I think what we need to know to just lay some context for today is that this is someone who very uniquely thinks in a very deep way about the connections between music, society, culture, and history. Um, and that whatever he has to say on these topics, he has a YouTube channel where he can riff in these unscripted ways on a variety of, of interesting things. So like Kevin said, not a music heavy hour, but this is someone who we learned earlier today spends hours and hours and hours listening to music and kind of being a conduit for us um, in his through his many, many forays into everything that he listens to and the, the thoughts that he synthesizes about that and how it pertains to culture and the world we're in today. So lots, lots to talk about. Um, so without further ado, Ted, can you just say hello to everybody? <laughs> well, thank you for inviting me to do this. I'm looking forward to it. This should be fun. Excellent, excellent. Um, so, you know, like I mentioned in the, the uh, rambling introduction, um, Ted spends hours, weeks, months, years listening to music and his musical interests range far beyond uh, classical music and what we call classical music. And if you're um, a Solestina lifer, you know that we like to think our definition of, of classical music is pretty broad. Um, the widest tent is, is how we like to refer to it. But we wanted to put the question to you, Ted, um, where and how does classical music fit into the scope of your work in the musical space? Um, and how do you define classical music? Well, I've got to say that my background is primarily as a jazz person. And um, that I spent many years preparing to be a jazz musician. And I worked as a jazz musician and I ran a jazz record label and I've written books on jazz. Um, but I've always had a deep interest in classical music, and over the last five, ten years, I find myself gravitating towards it more and more. My most recent book, Music, a Subversive History, probably had more about classical music in it than anything. And just my personal listening, I see that I, I tend, my own listening tends more and more to classical music now. I probably listen now more to classical music than any other genre. Why do you think Although that I is? Although I pride myself on listening to every kind of music. That's a, Right. That's right. a, um, something I try to do as a, as a part of my daily regimen. Right. So why do you think it is that you've been naturally gravitating more and more towards classical? Well, first of all, I think the classical music scene now is a lot more vibrant uh, than people realize. I know that there's a perception among many in the public that uh, classical music is something that happened hundreds of years ago. And that if you care about music today, the last thing you're going to do is listen to classical music. That could not be further from the truth. And in fact, there are a lot of outstanding young composers uh, that are, are doing great work now. And, and it's interesting, classical music is breaking down barriers because I hear classical albums now that borrow heavily on jazz, progressive rock, or cinematic music, almost anything goes now in classical music world. And so you know, people talk about new music as if it's scary, you know, daunting, or so something they've got to avoid at all costs. But my experience is, is the exact opposite. I think we're in a great era of new classical music. And the tradition never gets old. The tradition never gets old. I, I, was, I was talking to you earlier about this. Uh, my son is um, a senior at Harvard. He's a philosophy major. 
and he's taking a class this term in the Bach Cantatas. He's so excited about this because he's, he's a piano player, but what he's found is this is less a music history course. It's becoming more of a performance course. Mm -hmm. And he's showing up in class several times a week and has to sing. He's singing these complex cantatas. He's never, he's never done this before. He's got no training as a singer. And he finds it extraordinarily exciting and energizing. He and I have uh, several phone conversations every week just talking about Bach cantatas. And he'll tell me each week the one he's singing. Uh, and then I will listen to it. I spend time every night listening to the cantatas he's singing each week. And once again, people tend to think of this as this music from hundreds of years ago, and it's, it's boring or stuff. It, it couldn't be far enough from the truth. Uh, even the old music can be very energizing and mind expanding if you give it a chance. Right. So yeah, I see a comment from Russell in the chat where he's saying, contemporary classical today is blurring to the point that it is questionable if it can still be a useful term. Can you comment on that? Um, just the, the label of classical. Well, I know, like I said, my main background was in jazz and people always want me to define jazz. And there's this famous quote, people disagree who said it, was it Louis Armstrong or Fats Waller or whoever, but basically someone asked this musician, well, how do you define it? And he said, if you have to define it, you better not mess with it. And I always feel that when we start worrying about definitions, that's, a, that's not a good sign because generally, Anything that's vibrant and alive is difficult to pin down. The only time it's absolutely easy to define something is after it's dead. And the fact that we have difficulty agreeing on what exactly constitutes classical music, I think that's a positive sign. Interesting. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and I feel the same way in the jazz world right now. It, it's very difficult to, to describe exactly what's going on because it's, it's morphing and changing and expanding. Mm -hmm. So I don't, I think it's actually very difficult to define what classical music is, especially right now, but that's probably a very healthy sign. That's so interesting. I never thought about it like that, that um, genres are more like postmortems after the fact. <laughs> well, you know, if you look at some genre from the ancient past, like Gorian chant or whatever, I don't, you know, dispute over what it is. Mm -hmm. and, and those are, it's always very easy to define something once it's gone. Right. Classical yeah. music is is changing and I'd like to see it change more. I think there's great opportunities to engage with a larger audience hmm. that we've only begun to tap. Hmm. Ed, uh, I was just thinking about you describing your son's class and in my personal experience too, I feel like the best way to learn about music and appreciate it is, is to actually participate in it. And I'm just wondering if, um, how often you make an effort to, to try to play the music uh, that you really, that you really dig? Well, for me, I started out as a, as a performer before I became a music historian or a music writer. Uh, when I was a, a teenager, I had a life-changing moment. And I don't know, I'm 16 years old, I guess. And I was been playing the piano, but without a lot of passion. You know, I had taken piano lessons like anybody and I was learning the, the, the classical repertoire, but very simple pieces. I got to a point where I was playing rock and roll and playing in some, with some rock bands. And both of those were interesting, but they, they, there was a gap there. You know, the, the classical music was very intellectually satisfying, but it wasn't emotionally stimulating the way the rock was. The rock music was the mirror image of it. It was very emotionally powerful for me, but didn't have a deep intellectual component. A lot of the songs I was playing were very simple. You know, you get a four chord song, you were happy to get that fourth chord. <laughs> and some of them only had three or less. And just on a lark, I decided to visit a jazz club. Now, I still don't know why I did this. It just, I just, it was a jazz club a few miles from where I lived called the Lighthouse in Hermosa Beach. It's still there, in fact. And there was a, Jazz radio station I started to listen to. And they had ads for the lighthouse. Sorry, wait, hold on. You grew up in like the South Bay area? Hawthorne. California? Grew in Hawthorne. Oh, okay. Hawthorne. I live in Palos Verdes right now. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a South Bay. All right. But um, there was an LA radio station for jazz. I started listening to it. I'm 16 years old. 
And they would do these radio ads for the lighthouse about these musicians coming. I didn't recognize any of the names. And at the end of the radio ad, I loved it. The announcer who had the coolest voice in the world, it's just like this really deep, resonant, like Barry White kind of voice. At the end of the commercial, he would say, and miners are always cool at the lighthouse. And I thought, well, miners are cool at the lighthouse, you know? I'm gonna go to the lighthouse. I'm gonna go there and try to be as cool as possible because miners are always cool at the lighthouse. So anyway, I went there and I'm 16 years old. And there's a jazz band playing, Yusef Latif. I, I still remember everything vividly about this number. It's decades ago. I remember everything vividly. I remember what the band was wearing. Al Heath was playing drums, Bob Cunningham on bass, Kenny Barron was still alive playing piano. And they went on stage and Yusef Latif counted in this very fast tempo and they off to the races. And this, all of a sudden this, the walking bass is going and the drums. And literally after 10 seconds, I said to myself, this is it. This is what I want to do with my life. It's interesting. I, I had a friend that was a scholar in Japanese culture and had lived in Japan for a while as an anthropologist. He went to a kabuki theater. He said, Ted, if you go to a kabuki theater, if you're really knowledgeable, there are certain moments in the performance that the audience can shout out things. And he said, the best time was this dramatic moment in the kabuki performance. He said, I'm in Tokyo. And the guy behind me stands up and shouts out, this is the moment I've been waiting for. That was the guy behind, this is the moment I've been waiting for. And when he told me that, I said, that's like me at the lighthouse. I should have stood up and said, this is the moment I've been waiting for. Anyway, that, that changed my life and I literally, for the next 10 years, I started practicing the piano three hours a day. And I just wanted to be a jazz piano player. And I did that for him. I made records, I performed. I got, my record was on 500 radio stations. Um, in my early 30s, I started developing arthritis. This was, this was traumatic to me. My whole self-image was as a jazz musician, as a piano player. And I, I'm happy to say that I have no arthritis symptoms. I'm pain-free, I'm completely pain-free. It's almost a miracle. But in my early 30s, I couldn't play the piano anymore. And so I had to reinvent myself. So I became a music writer. But you asked, this, the question you started this with is, do I ever play the piano myself as, as, as a, you know, just not just a music writer, but performance? To me, everything I do is grounded in performance. Uh, and, and my appreciation of music is from understanding what it's like to be a performer. And there's one more thing I'd like to stress, which is very important to me. In our culture, there's too much of a division between the audience and the performer. I'm told that in some traditional cultures, these anthropologists or ethnomusicologists go out there. You see, some of these traditional societies don't even have a word for audience. Because in their communities, everybody participates in the music. If there's music tonight, we're all singing, we're all dancing, we're all, you know, playing percussionists, this, whatever. We've lost something of that in our society. We tend to view music as something for elites, for somebody on the stage at Carnegie Hall, or for some rock star at the, at the stadium. What we need, what I love about my son is you see in these Bach cantatas, he's not even a singer. But we need more of that in society. You know, we need to have opportunities for people to sing rather than just in the shower. And there's a hunger for it. You see. You're driving in the commute. You could see in the rear view mirror the person behind you singing along to the radio. There's a hunger for people want to participate in the music. Mm -hmm. So I believe also we need as a musical culture to find ways to, to, to break down this divide between audience and performer and, and to give everybody a sense of that wonderful feeling. That wonderful feeling of what, what playing music, what singing, what doing music, whether people can, can bring you. I'm just going to plug. Okay, I, got, I got on my high horse. Thank you for no, no, no. I was just going to say I'm going to plug, me plug on that. But these, you know, <laughs> this is the moment I'm waiting for. That's the moment I want to remember. <laughs> this is the moment I want each of you out there to have some opportunity in life where you can stand up and say, "This is the moment I've been waiting for." I was just going to say that uh, this season we decided to start each concert uh, with uh, a piece that we commissioned, where the composer actually wrote a part for the audience as well. Yeah, so it's sort of response. like an anthem. <laughs> yeah, a call and response, and then also there's a part where they sing while we play too. So 
Uh, so we completely agree with you. Well, oh, it's tremendous. I don't know if you've ever seen Bobby McFerrin. He'll do these concerts. Yeah. And he'll force the audience to say, <laughs> they, have no, they have no choice, but they That's end up loving it. I mean, good, I mean, and the things he's able to get the audience to do are very complex. Yeah. And you wouldn't think it's possible until you see it. People have much greater capacities than society allows them to express. We would be much better if we, I always, there's one thing I do with, with, with just my readers as a writer. I always assume that my reader is smart and demanding and has great capacity. And I don't worry about challenging them because I feel that most people have the ability to operate at a higher level than our society demands. And we're doing people a favor if we give them an opportunity to operate at that higher level. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, uh, earlier today we spoke, um, we spent a lot of time talking about diversity and in, um, in the classical music world, there's you can see in orchestras, especially and organizations, you know, a sort of um, conscious effort to make the classical music space more equitable. And um, I thought your thoughts on diversity in music in general were really uh, fascinating. I wouldn't. Uh, would you mind sharing them with us? Well, you know, I just I'm gonna I'm gonna pitch my book. Yeah, I, 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 as I, I, mean, I wrote this book that came out recently, Music is Subversive History. It's an entire history of music, going back like, to the days of the Neanderthals and the, and the cave paintings and all that. Um, but one of the things that came very clear to me researching this book is how diversity is not just an empty word, but it's actually the source of all music innovation. It was almost uncanny what my research showed. But every major musical innovation in history has tended to come out of a society of mixed cultures. Let me just give you a few examples. In ancient Egypt, now going back 3,000 years ago, this is like between the 18th and 20th dynasties of ancient Egypt. Something unusual happened in a village called Deir el Medina. It's a tiny village. But in this village, they invented a new way of singing. And this new way of singing, we take for granted, but it was extraordinary at the time. This new way of singing was to sing about your own feelings. Now we tend to think that all singers do that, don't we? <laughs> when you listen to a song, the singer is singing about their feelings. That wasn't always the case though. For thousands of years, people sang about the gods or the king, or but your own feelings were not considered legitimate as a source of a song. And so all of a sudden, in one village, you have these love songs and songs of personal emotion. You can't even find them anywhere else in ancient Egypt. But in this one village, the archaeologists have uncovered these. And this is the first place where people began singing about themselves, this little village called Deir el Medina. Well, what do we know about this village? Well, it was the most diverse village in all of Egypt because it's where the artisans who did skilled work on the, on the pyramids, not the lower manual labors, these were the skilled artisans. It's where they lived. And so some of them would come from hundreds of miles. And we know from the inscriptions and the surviving archeological data that people from 40 different racial or ethnic groups lived in this one village. Now, is it coincidence that this new way of singing happened in the most diverse village in Egypt. But then I look at other examples. You know, I, as you know, I'm a big jazz fan. I just told you about my kabuki moment. Um, jazz originated in New Orleans. And at the time jazz originated there, that was the most diverse city in the United States. You had the African population, the Caribbean population, you had the French influence, the Spanish influence, you had the Native American influence. Is it coincidence that the most diverse city in the United States produced jazz? And then I say, well, look at port cities. I think port cities are very in, or border cities. Because port cities and border cities are where different cultures mix. And it's interesting how much musical innovation came out of port cities. You know, opera was, visit, was invented in, in Venice, the great port, diverse population. The madrigal, the same way. You have uh, the Troubadour Revolution came from uh, the, the Spanish 
uh, French border area. Even in our own lifetime, the Rock Revolution, they call it the British invasion. Where did the British invasion come from? Was it Buckingham Palace or, or Downing Street? No, it was Liverpool, a port city, the most diverse city in, in, that you're gonna find in England. So the point I'm making is diversity is the source of innovation. It's the source of exciting new music. And that's why we should promote it. And, and I think we do a lot of harm I see a lot of people who want more diverse music, but they do a lot of harm because the way they promote it is damaging to the cause. And, and they'll go to, to youngsters at schools or audience and say, well, you should, you should listen to this music because it's fair or it's, there's a political reason to listen to this music. Or, and I know from my experiences, once again, in jazz, I know a lot of passionate jazz fans who just love the music, but I don't know one that became a jazz fan going to the jazz club seeking fairness. What they want is an exciting, vibrant, life-changing experience. And diversity brings us there. And so I think diversity is important, but we would be much better as a culture if we promoted diversity because of how it can broaden everybody's lives. It can enrich our lives, it can expand our horizons, it can show us things we wouldn't see otherwise. Mm -hmm. And just, I worry we lecture people too much. Yeah. You gotta do this, you gotta do that. Oh, these are the 10 composers you have to listen. I hate an article. These are the 10 composers you have to listen. To. Yet, it should be, I'm going to blow your mind with these 10 composers. I mean, that's what it should be. That should be the, prop, the value proposition. And this is what I try to do with my readers as a music critic. The value proposition is I'm going to blow your mind. We're going to shake, rattle, and roll. We're going to, you know, we're going to totally rock. I'm going to, even if it's classical music, it's the same mind frame. Yeah. That when we're done with this, you're going to be blown away by what you're going to experience because we're going to listen to something you haven't heard before. And more often than not, you're going to have to go to someone from a different community than your own to get that kind of life-changing, mind-expanding experience. Right. So that's my diversity. Yeah. So Ted, walk us through how it is that you discover and consume new-to-you music. Well, I've been doing this for about 10 years. And I guess I started out as a music historian. And at a certain point, I said, you know, I want to listen to more new music. And I started devoting two, three hours a day listening to new music. Most often, it's just some album that was released in the last few days. And I now listen, like so far this year, I've listened to almost 1,000 uh, newly released recordings. All styles, all genres. I, I have no limits. I will listen to anything. I'll listen to classical music. Obviously, my, my big ones, I love jazz, blues, classical music, and world. Those are the, but I'll listen to rock, pop, film soundtracks, video game soundtracks. I'll listen to anything just to try to, and, I, and the goal every day is, is I'm looking for something that's going to blow my mind and, and break, <laughs> totally rock and will expand my horizons. And so, and then every year I publish a list of my hundred favorite albums of the year. And I'd like to pride myself on thinking this is about as diverse a list of music as you're gonna find. But you gotta understand though, as I said before, I'm not lecturing people, hey, you, gotta, you have to listen to this. I'm, I'm inviting them to listen to it because I think it's going to excite them, energize them and, and fulfill my number one view, which is music is transformative catalyst for change in our life and source of enchantment. And so that's the music. I try to see my role as a music writer, as a guide to people to find that transformative music. Right, right. Um, can you, um, it would be great to listen to an example of something that you found, you know, somewhat through serendipity, but also through the staggering amount of time that you spend combing through all this new stuff. Um, and tell us what happened in the aftermath of your coming across the John DePew song that we'll listen to. Okay, yeah, no, we were talking about this earlier and, and, and I was trying to explain that you know, people ask me, well, how do you find good new music? And it's hard because it's, it's more hidden now than it ever was before. And I find that the best new music isn't coming out of the major labels anymore. And often the records I like the most, nobody tells me about them. So I try to cultivate contacts of people who will tell me about good music. I try to do it around all around the world. Like if I get a, sometimes I'll get a fan letter and, 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 my, and I'll, so I'll get a letter from somebody in 
Ted, I'm one of your readers in, in Bogota, Colombia. I liked your book, was translated into Spanish. And so I always write back and I said, thank you. And if you hear any good music in, in Bogota, let me know about it. And the next day, maybe someone from Indonesia. So I just, I build up these contacts. Of, and I'm always looking for people to tell me about the good new music. This is like my, this is my fun. This is, this is my simple fun in life is to try to find the good new music. I'm convinced it's hidden. And then I just, I just look around on, online. I go to band camp almost every day and I look for self-produced albums from different parts of the world. And, and a lot of times I recommend these albums and the musician will come back and say, how did you ever hear me? How did you even hear about my music? And no one knows about it. And now you've promoted it. And I, 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 I keep my ears open. So I'm gonna share with everybody just an example of someone I listened to it was very exciting to me. Uh, and maybe I've helped this guy in his career. I don't, that's always the goal is to help, you know, if you can, Get, get, get an audience or something. Uh, but this is just, it was a self-produced album put up on band by a guy named John DePew. And my understanding is he's a, a farmer in Kansas. And I told you this miles away from the nearest town, like in the middle of nowhere, okay? And apparently he, he does, you know, bail and hay or I don't know. I would, I'm, I'm not a good judge of what happens on a farm, but at night he goes home and he plays guitar or banjo and he sings. And then he made some recordings of his music. And I'm listening to this and I'm like, oh, this guy can sing. He's a darn good guitarist too. And I just listened to this. And this is what makes my life exciting. No one ever heard of this guy, but oh, this guy is good. So I, I touted him on Twitter and three of the red hot chili peppers picked up on this. And he started, oh, this guy is good too. So Flea is now backing him too. And now, all of a sudden, John DePew and his farm in Kansas are getting calls from people, and he's got like gigs, and he's playing, he's playing in festivals. I call this the Lonesome Kansas sound. And so we're going to play it. Listen to his voice and his guitar, banjo work. And this is just an example. And maybe you won't like, but I find this exciting and energizing, and it'll be very different. I trust me, it'll be very different from what you can hear on the radio or on TV these days. So let's let's listen to a song by John DePew. Wish I had a nickel Wish I had a dime Wish I had my own true love To warm this lonely life I left my sweetheart in Virginia And I came out west alone Said I'd send her some money for a railroad fare Just as soon as I found home I rode with Freddie Jackson Out on the open range We shot 100 buffalo And we left them carcasses laid I wish I Sweetheart, a letter saying, Come. 
come whenever you can She sent me back my last gold dollar Says she's marrying another man I wish I had my own true love 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 Okay, I think you, you can tell why I call that the lonesome Kansas sound. Yeah, yeah. But if, you know, like I say, this I, I found that extremely charming because he's got a lovely voice and he hits those high notes like they're nothing. Yeah. And he can play and, yeah, and he's it, totally it emotionally it. committed to it. Yeah. Um, and so that's, that's my fun is, you know, I'm just going through self-produced albums. I just like stumble on these things. And literally though, every week, there are two or three things I'm going to find every week that just excite me. And then like, I'll grab my wife, you've got to listen to this, or my kids. Or, or then a lot of it is what I do on Twitter, too. Or what I'm doing with my, I've got a column on Substack now, where I'm just, I share the music I love. I don't even write reviews anymore. Mm -hmm. I mean, reviews is like, I take an album at random, and I say if it's good or bad. All I, what I do now is I just find music that delights me. That excites me, and then I, I I share it with people. This is music that I'm enjoying. I'd like you to enjoy it. Hmm. You know that the feeling I got from listening to that was I don't know if you know the song "O oh, Agamemnon." Oh, yeah. Still, yeah, I yeah, love yeah, yeah. That song, oh, just reminds me of kind of that same feeling. Um, so, um, <laughs> what do you think about? Uh, we, we earlier we were talking about how. Like there's no word in some cultures for audience, you know, but nowadays we consume our music, you know, completely separate from the artist. You know, <laughs> I mean, we do it online, we do it through a computer, we do, you know, however. Uh, what do you think about that? Well, there's good and bad about it. I know the internet has been destructive to the livelihoods of many musicians. And I take that seriously. I often use a word, I talk about the music ecosystem. And that's how I view the music world is we're all interconnected. And you always have streaming platforms, record labels, you have people doing what you're doing, people like me that write about the music, obviously the musicians, the audience, but we're all connected in this ecosystem. And I'm worried that the ecosystem has been degraded uh, by the streaming platforms for a variety of reasons. The most obvious one is the streaming platforms are clearly taking music out of, um, they're taking money out of the music and reinvesting it elsewhere. And I don't think people realize the impact of this. In the old days, people complained that the record label was run by crooks or the record stores were crooks or the record distributors were crooks. And in fact, I ran a record label and I would say the record distributors were crooks, you know? But- I was gonna say they still are. <laughs> but give these crooks credit for one thing, that if they made money, they reinvested it in releasing more albums. And like, if you were Russ Salmon, you own Tower Records and you made money, you opened up another record store in another city. And eventually you had hundreds of these things, but you, you reinvested the money back into the music ecosystem. But nowadays, who are the biggest money makers in music? Well, there's Apple. Apple Music will take money from music and will invest it in devices. What they really want to sell are things like this. They would give away the music for free to sell more devices, which may work for them, but they, they could kill, you see, the music is such a small pond for them and they could kill all the fish and not even worry about it. And Google is the same way, they own YouTube. So they're this, they're this, they're one of the largest too. And they, they do give away music for free just to do advertising. And, and, and Spotify is taking all this money from music now and investing it in podcasts. And, and so the, the, the streaming system is destructive to the ecosystem. 
because it sucks money out of, out of the musicians and the music and doesn't reinvest it. And the reason they don't reinvest it, they'll say, well, there's no profitability in music. There's no profitability in music because they're the ones that collapsed the, 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 the price level. They're the ones that decided unlimited music for everybody for $9.99 a month. Uh, so anyway, I could talk about that for an hour and I'm not going to, because it's a sad, sad story, my friend. So we're, we're, oh, let's look at the positive side. There's something very positive about this internet revolution, which is we can all communicate with each other. Somebody can put up, there's somebody in New Zealand tonight uplifting, uploading their song onto the web that I'm gonna to hear tomorrow. Or I'm in, it's beautiful for me, I'm in contact with musicians all over the world. Sometimes it's just passive contact, I listen to their music. But if I want to, it's very easy to communicate with these people, not just for me, because I'm a music critic. You go on Bandcamp, you want to contact the musicians, it's very easy. And so, so the whole, the world is flat. And so it's extraordinary our ability to have these musical dialogues all over the world. And that's extraordinarily positive because um, just think back, you weren't around then, I'm, I'm an old geezer, but I was back in the old days that it was impossible for a musician in, in India or Africa or Eastern Europe to break into the US music world. And now look at K-pop. I mean, K-pop is the most obvious example of this. K-pop is everywhere. Now, it's not my most favorite genre, but I respect the idea that they can take this music and just send it all over the world. That's tremendously exciting. And I think in the future, you'll see, I think you're going to see APOC in the future, African pop. I think that's going to be a huge thing. There's such musical creativity down there. And these, these musicians have not had access to Western markets. And with the internet now, they don't even need a record contract. Mm -hmm. They don't need to work for the man anymore. It's all within their own power. Uh, so this is a very positive thing. So I don't dis to dismiss for a second the negative impact of the internet on everything. But there's a tremendous upside. And for those who know how to channel it, this connectivity will be a great blessing. So the internet allowed you to find Susanna Raya. Or Raya, am I, am I saying that right? Susanna Raya, right. yeah, no, this is, another, this is another good example. This was one of the, the, this is going back a few years ago, another musician I just stumbled upon mm -hmm. because I'm looking around. And, and this was a, a, a woman who had no record contract was uh, from Spain. I think she was living in Northern Europe at the time. I think she's back in Spain now. I'm not, I'm not sure where, but she just did these videos from her home. She just sort of sit on her couch at night. And once again, it was like John DePew. She, she would sing, she would play guitar. And uh, I did a book a few years ago called The Jazz Standards. It just came out in a new edition here where I talk about the, uh, the, uh, the uh, best jazz songs. And I give examples for each one. And I, and I referred to her in this book and people were surprised. They said, Ted, you refer to this musician's got no record contract. You just referred to a homemade YouTube video. And I said, well, this, is, this was very impressive to me. And so this is another example of something I would never have been able to find, except that the connectivity allows us to do this. So I think I've given you, uh, a video of her once again just sitting at home playing the guitar. She's an exquisite guitarist. Mm. And then singing uh, Morning of the Carnival, a, a bossa nova song from Brazil. Uh -huh. And, and her, 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 her voice is lovely too. But once again, this is just homemade. Yeah. And it's an example of the things that are out there that a few years ago I wouldn't even be able to access, but because of the connectivity, I can't. All right, Adon, if you wouldn't mind.
pois há de haver um dia to be painful you know? <laughs> be enjoyable you know once again and i think you get a sense of my my taste too because once again she's absolutely emotionally committed to the performance right which is important to me as a listener um and one of the things i try to do as a music critic is to guide people to, and, and and with a trust that something that that moves me may move them as emo emotionally as well yeah Ted, we predicted that we would um, allow the conversation to sort of take twists and turns, but um, and it, it, we could have done even more than we did. But I want to make sure we have time for one particularly salient question right now, which is if you could address how you see the COVID pandemic impacting um, creativity in our field, it would be great to hear your take on that. 
Well, we've just heard a couple examples of musicians just working at home and, and finding joy and solace in music making. And I think that this was much more widespread than we realized. I'm told that guitar sales hit new levels during the pandemic and that music making really took off. And that didn't surprise me at all. My house, once again, my house when my kids were sent back from college and they spent a lot of time playing piano. And this was there was one of the, the things that kept them sane in, in a very difficult time. Uh, one of the things though that I, I, my research has shown though, and I think this is fascinating, is what happens after a pandemic. And there's some interesting historical evidence that epidemics and plagues are followed by great periods of cultural blossoming and expansion and, and actually just out and out party. I mean, the, probably the most obvious example of this is the, is the great plague in Europe that just killed huge numbers of people. And it came to a, a halt around 1348 or 1349. Now, if you look at your history books, they'll tell you the Renaissance started in 1350. Now, is this just coincidence that the Renaissance began right after a plague? Well, you, well, you can easily dismiss that if it was just one incident of this, but we've seen that elsewhere. You know, Shakespeare and, and that great extraordinary moment in, in British culture uh, happened. At, uh, you know, he went through these terrible plague experiences as a young man. And afterwards, people want to be entertained. Probably the best example of this, I did enormous research on the Great Plague in England of the 1660s. It's covered in depth in Samuel Pepys' diary. Daniel Defoe wrote a book called A Journal of the Plague Year. This was a terrible plague and killed huge numbers of people. But afterwards, people wanted to party like no one's business. You know, and Pepys will say, just as, as soon as the numbers of, of deaths declined, Everywhere he went, there was singing and dancing. And, and, and so, and I've actually studied this even going back to ancient Greece and in different cultures. There's definitely a historical record that after a period of tremendous plague or epidemic, often we get a benefit afterwards because people begin to appreciate all these things they gave up when they were locked up. So, and maybe I'm just being too optimistic. I do think there's a good possibility we're going to have a real cultural blossoming in the next few years, uh, just as we follow the expected pattern of people starting to say, hey, I wanna go to the clubs. I wanna support the, the clubs, the concert halls, the nightlife. I wanna go uh, hear this performance. Uh, and also I just, hey, I, I learned a lot about music myself during the, the lockdown because I, I got a musical instrument and now I wanna go and be, become part of the larger musical community. So it, there's been a terrible curse on all of us and, and going through this pandemic has been uh, difficult for many, I mean, psychically and physically and financially, but maybe just maybe there will be a payoff in terms of our, our culture as the aftermath of this. On that note, I would like to take a, a brief time out to do our usual asking for your support. And today we have something very fancy and exciting to try, which is a QR code. Check that out. <laughs> so you can also hear my son always does this when I'm unmuted. He's trying to come into <laughs> come into the room. As you all know, these happy hours are free every week, 74 episodes, if you want to call them that strong, um, but definitely not free for us to produce. Um, and we really appreciate any um, support. And that comes with a huge, huge thank you to those of you who have already done so and who have signed up to be recurring donors. That just means the world to us. And it's precisely what keeps these things going. So thank you so much. And if you're new or if you'd like to give a little bit more at this time and you can, we can try this. <laughs> Trying to shake things up over here. What can I say? And thank you, Audrey, for making this. OK, so now that that business is done, um, we'd love to move on to the Q&A with the audience. So David Codell, are you with us? Are you in a break from your work? Um, we'd love for you to ask your question next. Yeah, I'm here. So my question is, uh, is 
It's a mundane, stupid question, but I'll ask it. How often do you think people need to hear a new kind of music before they gain an attraction or an appreciation of it? Well, I think that varies. The question is, you know, how many times you need to hear a new kind of music before you can begin to appreciate it. Uh, and I do have a rule that if there's some music that I don't like, and other people were telling me, you know, Ted, this is great stuff. You don't know what you're talking about. My approach is to listen to it over and over again. That, that's my, that's my time-tested policy that uh, I will listen to it over and over again with the idea that familiarity will not breed contempt, as the proverb says, but maybe some kind of delight or enjoyment. And I take enjoyment very seriously. You probably picked that up. Uh, and, and I just... I don't under, to me, this is just the, the centerpiece of the whole musical experience. We do this to, for the enjoyment and, and delight and ex, mind expanding impact on our life. But I'll be honest, my, my personal experience is generally when I hear something new that, that's really good, I like it the first time, usually. I go back to my kabuki moment. This is the moment I've been waiting for. I'd never been in a jazz club before. So I, I don't believe Music should be a drudgery. And I think the whole music education system is sick in that regard. You know, I meet so many people who say, I wish I had stuck with my piano lessons, but they were just so terrible, so painful. And I gave them up. And I, and I just, and, and, and I saw this in my own field of jazz, which is such a, so important to me and, and brings such joy in my life. And, and I would see like, you know, the, the Ken Burns special, where they'd have some talking head who kept on saying, this music is important. You should listen to it because it's important. No, no you, should. you should listen to it because it's fun. <laughs> you should listen to it because you're, you're going to have a blast. And, that, and so I believe that, it, that there's no reason why you can't enjoy some new musical experience the very first time. That might even be the best time to have it just you know, blow you away. And one of the things I, my covenant with my readers is to try to guide them on that process. You know, I wrote a book called How to Listen to Jazz. And, and it, I might as well call it how to have a blast with jazz because the whole purpose of the listening experience, and, and I know your focus is mainly classical, but classical music is no different. Classical music is no different. You know, and I'll tell you just one quick story and then I'll, and I'll be quiet, but you know, I came from a, a mixed Italian Mexican household in, in, in Hawthorne, California. Neither of my parents went to college. I was the first generation to, went to go to college. My Mexican mother had a brother named Ted, I was named after him. She was devoted to her brother. Because she had a tough, her parents were, his dad, was, she had a tough dad. My granddad was a mean guy. And the only family member who was good to her was her brother Ted, who was a few years older, who had the potential to be a great composer. When he was 11 years old, he would put, pillows in the bed as though he was asleep. He would climb out the window. He would take the streetcar to downtown LA to go to the opera <laughs> at age 11. And then he, he, he didn't have the ability to go to college, even though they kept on skipping him through grades. And he finished high school and he was a very young man. There was no money for him to go to college, so he had to become a sailor. And his passion was classical music. And, you, and on, on boats back then, you couldn't play record players because they would jump. So. He would buy musical scores. He would spend all his money. He had the complete works of Mozart and leather volumes, complete works of Beethoven. He would bring these on the, the ship with him. And he would, he would look at them for joy and, 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 and satisfaction. And uh, it was a great tragedy. He died in a plane crash when he was 27. He was talking about leaving the Merchant Marines and going to Berkeley. He was corresponding with Albert Einstein, the great Mozart scholar, they even had my uncle write liner notes for an album by Haydn's brother, Michael, because my, my uncle had taught himself German so he could read the primary documents, you know? And, and I guess the point I'm making is most people would not think a working class Mexican American uh, uh, from the fringes of South Central LA would find joy and liberation in Haydn and Mozart, but it's absolutely possible. And if it was possible back then, it's possible right now. And it's possible next week and next month. And those are the kinds of experiences we should be fostering. Thank you. I hope that answered your question. I probably went off on a tangent. <laughs>
That's the price you pay when you ask me a question. Thank you. Thanks, Thank David. You. Uh, Marianne, would you like to unmute yourself and ask your question? So how do we best contact you when we hear a piece of music that's wonderful, that we think is wonderful? Maybe you won't think it's wonderful, but how does, what's the best way to contact you? Well, I've got a website, it's just my name, tedjoya.com, and, okay. and my email address is there. Okay, wow. And okay. I'm on Twitter, I, I, I try to make it easy for people to contact me. You, okay. I can attest to that, having been the one I'm who contacted you. I'm easy you to reach, I'm, I'm pretty accessible online. Uh, and I do, and, I'll, and I just got to say, I get, I get hundreds of people a week telling me about music I should hear, but it's almost somebody, always someone paid to tell me that. Okay. Uh, paid I'll... publicist or a record label. And I, lis I, I listen to what they say, but I put particular focus when somebody disinterested. Yes. reaches out to me and just said, this is, I, I don't even know this musician. It's just, I just love this. I think you will too. Okay. All right. So yeah. you, you should, if you're going to tell me, reach, make clear to me that you don't have, it's not your own record or your, 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 your mother's <laughs> vaults or you're not a paid <laughs> publicist, uh, but I am, I'm easily reached. And, and I do want to, I do, I'm always looking for good new music. So I have one more question if I may. Uh, so, so what do you attribute um, the fact that you are a, um, a famous writer, musician, and your brother is a famous poet? What happened in your family that made this happen? Well, the, you know, I talked about my uncle who died in a plane crash. I didn't know about your uncle either. <laughs> and, and like I said, neither of my parents went to college. Mm -hmm. My mother was a telephone operator for many years. My dad started out as a servant. He was a chauffeur for a rich guy, grabbed a taxi, eventually operated his own business. But they, I think my mother in particular felt that her, her dad should have given her brother the support to develop his abilities and should have sent him to college. So from a very young age, my mother made clear to me that she was going to sacrifice to give me an opportunity to do that. She made that clear to my brother Dana as well. Uh, and so um, in many ways, we were expected to do the things that her, her sibling hadn't been able to do because of his early death. Okay. Um, so, and I and beyond that, I don't know, you know, Dana could easily have gone into music. I could have easily gone into poetry. Yeah. You know, we both, we both followed our bliss, uh, but uh, you know, he and I have very overlapping interests. We talk all the time and it's almost uncanny how much but we're on the same wavelength on artistic matters. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. Well, thank you so much. And thank you for your insights here. I, I love the idea that you just listen to anything and everything. I, I, that's a great, that's wonderful. Thank, well, thank you. you. Ted, how do you um, find the time to listen to all that music and write about it and be online and <laughs> <laughs> you know, people often ask me about my time management, and I, let me just talk just a little bit about that. I think it's I think it's important because this is something I've I've worked hard at. Is how do you use the hours in your day? And I believe there's a, a a terrible mistake in how most of this is done right now in society. The way I look at it is is there's part of your day, your work day involved in creating what we would call output. And it depends on what your job is. If you're working in the factory, the output's measured by how many widgets you make per hour. Uh, if you're a salesperson, they measure your sales down to the penny. You know, you know exactly how you're performing day in day. Even me as a writer, I know people say, well, how many words do you write per day? And it's very, everybody measures their output. The problem is we don't spend enough time thinking of our input. Mm -hmm. Because as you know, in any system, your output is, is limited by your input. And probably the smartest thing I did was I started focusing a lot on my inputs. And so I'm a writer, but I'll only spend two or three hours at most a day writing. Mm -hmm. I'll spend more time reading. I'll spend more time listening to music. And, and it's because I realized for me to do what I do, 
I need high quality inputs. They stimulate. You you probably have picked that up. The, the, the inputs stimulate. Yeah. And so, and I would think this is true for other people as well, though, that whatever your field is. And the problem is that your boss never worries about your input. The boss never says, you know, what books are you reading? You know, <laughs> yeah, are you, are you subscribing to the right magazine? Are you going to concerts? You know, the boss, the boss never asks you that. The boss just looks at your output. But the smart boss should ask about the inputs. But if, if the boss doesn't, we should take responsibility for them ourselves. And so I spend a lot of time listening to music and reading each day, which I enjoy. I'm not, I'm not, I don't, I, it's not a drudge. I, but to me, this is what allows me to be productive as a writer. And if I did not have that, I absolutely could not do what I do as a writer. To me, it would be impossible. Mira, would you like to unmute yourself and ask your question next? Oh, hi. <laughs> OK. Um, so I was at a science lecture. I don't remember when it was. And um, one of the main things that was discussed was the fact that what we uh, listen to in our teen years is what really holds in our mind and is what we will remember forever, love forever. That's our music. and. Well, in, in you might have like a secondary that like you heard in the house because your parents played it or something. But um, if somebody wants to really broaden what their tastes are, not just broaden what they listen to, but what they really love, develop new favorites, if you will. Is there like a process? Is there, um, you know, so many hours a week of listening to it or anything? Any, any suggestions? Well, this is something that you can't reduce to a science. And, you know, Maya was asking me earlier, how do I pick which new albums to listen to on Bandcamp? And I say, sometimes I just look at the ones with the nice album covers. You know, and it sounds stupid. But I don't try to get it down too much of a formula because what I want to do is to make myself open to new experiences. And so if somebody told me they wanted to broaden their musical horizons, I would say, okay, let's come out with a list of 10 things to do in the next month. First of all, I want you to go to a place where there's dancing and dance to some music that you've never heard. Two, I want you to go to a concert of, uh, of someone from a culture different than yours. I just make a list. And every item on this list, it's, its sole purpose is to take you out of your comfort zone and expose you. Now that said, if you go out in your comfort zone and you don't enjoy it, I'm not going to tell you to keep on hitting your head against the wall. But if you don't at least take the chance, you don't have the possibility of that exciting moment of transfiguration where you hear something that just, you go, wow. So I would say, and this is a philosophy, I, this is what I tell my kids. I say, if you have a choice between two things to do tonight or two things in your career or two jobs you might take, Always try to get precedence to what will take you out of your comfort zone. Because over the long run, that, that's powerful. Best thing I've done in my life is I did many things that took me out of my comfort zone. Not crazy things. You know, I, I don't, I don't like shoot up strange drugs, and snort <laughs> cinnamon or whatever. I don't know what. Not crazy things, but, but mind expanding things that could potentially transform me. And so you put yourself in those situations and if they don't work, you walk away. Ted, can I ask you a sort of pointed follow-up question? Ask, make it as pointed as you want. And I'll go ahead. As a <laughs> ratio, as best you can estimate, as a ratio, the good music to the meh music <laughs> to the bad music. <laughs> What's okay. the percentage? <laughs> because I, you're so optimistic and positive about okay, I don't like to talk you're about only that. sharing what you like. Oh. I'm wondering. Yeah, I, I don't like to talk about. Like I said, I've, I've listened to more than 900 albums this year. At the end of the at the end of this year, let's say I've listened to 1,100 albums. Okay. I will I will have a top hundred. Mm -hmm. I'll have an honorable mention of another hundred. So there'll be 200 of those 1,100 I actively recommend. Mm -hmm. Wow. Of the rest of ones that I don't recommend, there's still another 50 to 100 that are pretty darn good. Hmm. So probably my hit rate is, of the stuff I listen to, maybe one out of 10 really excites me. 
but there's probably another 15, 20 percent. Yeah, this is pretty good. I listen. I, I, I recommend this. Yeah, no. Now there's a lot of stuff that I just. <laughs> it's pretty bad, you know. But let's let's not. <laughs> I'm not going to pop their balloon. Right. <laughs> you know. Do, but do you do you actually I, I, listen? I, I can give you the list of the ten worst albums I've heard this year. You know, it's like some death metal band in Latvia where there's <laughs> and, and, and well, but maybe there's something cathartic for them. I'm not gonna who am I to judge as, as a famous man? Like, who am well, I to I am a music critic, but I don't believe my job is to criticize. I don't even like the word music critic. I say call me a music historian. Mm-hmm. I see my view as, as as sharing the transformative power of music, its source of enchantment as a catalyst in, in changing our lives. So I don't need to worry about the that Latvian death metal band. But but how much Maybe of a chance? Maybe they're finding something there I, I didn't pick up. God bless. Them. How much of a chance do you give music? Like you know, on when you first hear it, you're like, oh my, can I listen to five minutes of this? I mean, do you actually like go all the way through and give it a complete? When I say I listen to an album, I listen to it all the way through. Oh wow. <laughs> but there are a bunch I don't. Even, there are a bunch that don't even get that far though. So I mean, I'm just I'm. I don't, I'm, I consider myself like a gold prospector. I'm looking for the gold nuggets. Mm-hmm. The other stuff I'm just, you know, you know, but I, but I do try to listen to a lot of things all the way through because that's the only way you can really, and also it just helps me understand the musical culture. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. If you do what I do, and I've been doing this for 10 years, listening to music, new music every day, you really understand what's happening in the musical culture. And, and that even the, even the Latvian death metal bands helped me in that. Interesting. Uh, so, and so, so you- you're able to extract like uh, some kind of meaning or narrative for yourself um, and whether you enjoy it personally or not is, is beside the point. Because I think for some people like Kevin and myself, just speaking for you, Kevin, it would probably just make us really angry to have to listen <laughs> to a lot of bad music. <laughs> so we'd throw in the towel pretty quickly. So, you know, we applaud your commitment. Um, I remember in graduate school, the professor came in during an exam once. I think this was a cost accounting exam. And he said, students, just consider this one of life's variety of experiences. <laughs> and, and so when I, I, you know, and you're thinking, I did an exam. This is, this is not life's variety of experiences. But that's the way you've got to look. It's one of life's variety of experiences. Mm. And so there's, is there any uh, genre of music that, like, after being exposed to it over and over again, you just you just don't go near anymore. <laughs> Absolutely, no. There's no, I don't rule out anything. I okay. don't rule out anything. Uh, occasionally, there's some music I find offensive. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, but even that, I will listen to it just so I'm aware of what's going on. But then you may find this interesting. I would listen to something when my kids were around. I wouldn't listen. I, I don't want to. I don't want around my, my my children to validate the sentiments in this in a, in a song that I find uh, uh, offensive. But that that's a completely different conversation. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I do I do believe I do support freedom of expression. So the fact that I find something offensive uh, is 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 I don't believe uh, a big. I don't think it's a big deal. Mm-hmm. I think all of us. We would be better if all of us exercised our core values and principles in our cultural decisions. Mm-hmm. Now, that's not cancel culture, because cancel culture is when I'm trying to tell you what to listen to. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, I, and I don't do that. I don't say you can't. But, what I, but I think each of us should say, is my expenditures in the cultural economy reflect my values? And if, and if they don't, you should. You know, I just saw the other day, R. Kelly. Boy, I'm getting into controversial stuff, aren't I? Yeah. That's all right. R. Kelly was convicted. I don't even read that. I don't know. It was some sex crime. I don't even read the article. I don't want to, I don't want to, to, to sully my mind. But he was convicted. So he's guilty now. It's not a lead. He was guilty. Mm-hmm. I saw his album sales went up 500%. What? Ah! Oh, no. And I'm just saying, I don't believe in censorship. You got to realize I'm, I'm into freedom of expression. <clears throat> And, and I don't believe he should be deplatformed. But I do think each of those listeners should be looking in the mirror mm-hmm. and saying, are my choices in the terms of culture and music and art reflect my own core values? That's what I'd like to have. Instead of a cancel culture, I'd like to have individual, not on a, on a I, I'm nervous about giving people like Zuckerberg or Bezos control over my cultural diet. I, that to me, 
that's a dangerous path to go down. But I am completely supportive of each individual asking themselves some hard, tough questions mm-hmm. about the culture they consider. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I mean, has a record label ever asked you, I mean, I don't even know record labels now. Like, it seems like they're mostly just distributors now, but mm-hmm. has anybody asked you to just be part of their business, their, you know, their corporate structure? Well, I have the, the, I, I've had all sorts of strange relationships with record labels over the years. Mm-hmm. And I've had everything from people trying to, 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 to buy my approval for their record, which is sad because I know how little they would get. I know how little that generates in sales. Um, and I, and I, really don't, I don't really try to curry relationships but what I what I would you know I remember Bruce Lundville right before he left Blue Note, he heard me get a talk and said, you know, Ted, we got to get you out to talk to the team at Blue Note Record just so they hear what you have to say. Mm-hmm. And I would have, and then he received, he got booted out like a week later or something, and Don Was came in. But it, that those kind of relationships I would I would I would like to have. I'd like to have a positive impact on the music ecosystem. Yeah. So uh, mm-hmm. I don't want a job with a record label, but I would like to have, I'd yeah. like to be able to shape the values of the key decision makers in the music world. I have some influence, not not much. I have a tiny little, I'm, I'm more of a, a gad, I'm like a Socratic gadfly. And on Twitter, I, I know I irritate some people because I'm very critical, not of musicians. I rarely criticize musicians, but I criticize the institutions that control our musical life. Mm-hmm. And so I'm perceived as very critical of Spotify and Google and Apple Music and record labels. Um, but I have no joy in criticizing. What I would like to do is to construct a positive music ecosystem. Yeah. If I had more influence, uh, that, that would make me happy, not to grandize myself, but just to have a positive impact. Because that, to me, that in my stage of life, the most important thing to me is to have some positive impact on, on, on the people and situations I deal with. No, I mean, I was just thinking, if you started your own record label. Hmm. Oh, that's just, that, that's like, you know, in, in, in schools, the bullies would put a sign on your back, kick <laughs> me, and they wouldn't know, you wouldn't know you had that. <laughs> Starting a record label, that would be like putting that kick me sign. <laughs> on my, no, no, I, I, I ran a record label. I don't want to, I don't want to go down that. Path. Oh, you already did? That's something you've done? Already? I ran a record label when I was younger for three years. That's when I told you the, the record distributors were like dealing with the mafia. Yeah. <laughs> I could talk, I could share stories, but I'll tell that we need a we need a whole another hour. Oh my gosh! For, for those stories, but uh, I have no desire to work for a record label. But I would love to have a positive influence mm. on the key decision makers out there. Yeah, that that I would that would be a dream for me to have a positive impact. Uh, let me I'll, and I'll just give you one crazy idea. I mean, this will be my last crazy idea. Then you can shut me up at that. What would I do if I ran the zoo? Mm-hmm. Mm. What would I do if I ran one of these big record labels? I'll give you an example, and they would never do this. They would never do this, but I would, I'd pick the five best music schools that I could find. Mm-hmm. I don't, Juilliard, you pick Berkeley, I don't know, but I'd pick the five best. Then I would go and I would spend a few weeks at each one. I would talk to the professors, the deans, students, and I'd go to each one of them, I'd say, who are the best musician students? The ones with the most talent in your class. Who are the five best students at Julia? Who are the five best students at Berkeley? Who are the five best students at Eastman, at Curtis Institute? And then I would go to those five students and say, you know, I'm gonna give each of you $50,000. You're gonna make a record and you can do anything you can do pop album, you can write an opera, you can do a symphony, you can do video game music. I'm not going to constrain you. But I am told that you are one of the great, I know this is a great music school, and you're one of, you stand out even at this great music school. And I'm going to back you, I'm going to support you, and, and, and you can do whatever you want, I'm giving you the money to do it. Dream big and do something that's going to amaze me. Now, if you add up the total amount for that, it's tiny. Mm-hmm. Five people at five schools, fifty thousand each. They spend less, more on that on one album. Yeah, but there's not a single record label that would do that, which is bizarre. Because if you were a law, a law firm, you'd hire the best law schools. If you were 
uh, when I was consulting for him, you'd hire from the best business schools. If you wanted the engineer, you'd try to find the best students, but the, the music industry has no interest mm-hmm. in identifying and supporting the best music schools. So anyway, mm-hmm. that's why you could never let me run a record label because those are the kind of things I would do. So. Interesting. Well, Ted, thank you so much for your time. Okay, thank, thank you for giving me my, my little platform here and to everyone for your questions and participation. Of course, just in case you missed it, I wanted to share what um, Catherine said in the chat. I feel like my mind has been scrubbed and then polished. <laughs> I thought you would appreciate that. That's some positive impact. I will take that as a compliment. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, Ted. Um, okay, so long. We'll do it again sometime. Bye-bye. Oh, amazing. That would be great. Right. Bye-bye. And um, for those of you who are still here next week, it seemed like um, at least Jason, you were, uh, weren't sure what was coming next. Um, so far, we're still working out the details, but the plan is if you heard about the fellow who built the giant violin boat in Venice, <laughs> we're going to be talking to him, the artist, um, Livio De Marchi. I had the pleasure of talking with him via translator. Um, and the translator is an awesome musician in his own right. One of our colleagues, Roberto Cani, he's the concert master of the LA Opera Orchestra and also a violin maker. So it's going to be super fun and interesting. And this project, um, Livio's Boat Violin, he calls it Noah's Violin for obvious reasons. It's really just all you need to do is look at it and you feel like you know exactly what he wanted to do with this piece of art. It's really special. So we hope that you'll join us for that. <laughs> okay. Thanks again, Bye, Ted. Everybody. Thank you so much, Ted. Bye-bye.